everyone and welcome to our masterclass Q&A 2 where we have been showing you how to make your very own botanical eye cream. I'm Lisa Shelley, community manager for Formula Botanica. I'm here with the lovely Beatrice and Brooke. If you'd like to say hello, Brooke, we'll go to you first. Hi everyone, my name is Brooke and I'm the formulation tutor at Formula Botanica. So I've been part of working to create this wonderful masterclass for you and I hope you're all enjoying it so far. Let us know in the comments which lesson you've got up to. Have you got all the way up to lessons four and five? I think we're on lesson four today. Five, haven't we? five. Five, five, there you go. Have you got all the way up to lesson five or are you a little bit behind? Let us know in the comments. Yeah, great, Beatrice. Hi everyone, I am Beatrice. I am the for, uh, Formula Botanica Cosmetic Scientist and I helped with the technical materials for this masterclass and I hope you were enjoying it. Yeah, we've had all our team working on this. If you've just joined the live and you're new to the masterclass and you've just heard of it, we're teaching everyone to make their very own botanical eye cream in 10 lessons. So we really do make it so simple for you. We show you everything you need. We give you all the ingredients. We even have our very own masterclass kits we've, we've created. We have suppliers putting them together all over the world. So do grab one of those if you can. All you need to do is get your ticket head over to your study area and download everything we show you in there. And honestly, it really is so simple. We've had hundreds of thousands of people take our free trainings in the past, and we have 40,000 people registered for this masterclass, all in there working on their emotions and ready to make their eye cream. And it is loads of fun. And that is you guys as well. I'm just going to see the chat and see a couple of people have been there. I can see Alison, Bross, Winnie Pass, great name, Claudia, Myrna, We've got people from all over the world. We really do have a really fantastic international community and it is so great to see. I can see a couple of people. Sonia says lesson four. We have someone, I can't see their name, says lesson five. And the good thing about that, all those answers is there's no wrong answer. If you've just found the masterclass and you're on lesson one, that's okay. If you're on lesson five and you're up to date, that's okay too. You've got till October 17th to watch all of the lessons. There's loads of time and everyone has 10 minutes a day. From Monday, we've been releasing the lessons one each day at two o'clock UK time. So you just need to find 10 minutes a day and you can always catch up the next day if you can't watch it. They're not live. You just have to go back to your study area and check out the lesson. I can see more people saying hello. Kath, Aaliyah, Sonia, lesson three, Ross, lesson five. So well done, everyone. Thank you so much. It is really good to see like where you're up to and it's good to see your participation. We couldn't really do this without you. So Q&A two. Up to this point, we're talking about botanicals now. So a lot of you have made your emulsion and you have some extra questions. So we're going to be here for as well for as many questions as that we can see. We've also got two of our um, staff in the comments helping out as well. And let's crack on because otherwise we could be here forever because we know you've got tons of questions. I can already see some in there. But I'm going to start with some ones that we pulled out from the support thread that we have in our exclusive Facebook group. If you're not a member of that, please do go and join it. Okay, okay, we're going to dive right in. So, Anita asks, so in lesson three, Lorraine poured the oil phase into the water phase. What would happen if the water phase was poured into the oil phase? What determine, so what determines what you should do essentially? Oh, bro, I'll go to you. <laughs> okay, oh. so this is a, uh, something you can do either way technically you don't necessarily have to pour the oil phase into the water phase or the other way around um this depending on which way you around you do it it will make a little bit of a difference in the texture and the kind of emulsion you get at the end of it we chose to pour the oil phase into the water phase because that's what gave us the texture we wanted for this particular eye cream it's what works best for the emulsifier that we're using in this particular situation so in the amounts we've got and for the outcome and the texture we want, it's what works best for us. But you are more than welcome to try doing it the other way around. You can pour your water phase into your oil phase. It doesn't really matter because um, some emulsifiers, you do have to pour it one way or the other way. But this one is one way you can do either way. So have a, have a go at pouring it the other way around. See what you think to the texture and take some notes as to what you, which one you prefer. And that's an important note as well. Take notes. Like if you do it one way and then do it another way and write down the difference, that how you that's how you kind of learn with your formulation as well. So I'd say give it a go. Anita actually has another question, so I'm going to sneak it in just so they're together. So 
So she says, I suppose in the past, I've used preservative 12, uh, and then there's two long lanes there. <laughs> Can I use it for this formulation? How is this one different to the one Lorraine is using in the eye cream? So what would we say about that? Well, uh, I believe it should be phenoxyethanol, and this is a synthetic preservative. So it works, you can use it if that's your only option. But we prefer to use uh, preservatives that are accepted in natural formulations. So we chose to use the other one. But if that's the only option you have, go for it. There's no problem. Just check the usage rates, the pH, um, where your preservative works. So I think that's it. Yeah, so we do recommend a preservative. We do have an ingredients list. But, you know, as Beatrice says, if you do want to try something else, you can. What is good about formulating is it's kind of up to you what you use. We've put together a formulation, but if you do want to use something else, you can absolutely use it. Okay, so Sonora says, what lovely name, Sonora. So at what time, minutes, post water bath um, phase, do I add the oil and emulsifier beaker in the hot bath? Do you want to take that one, Brooke? So I don't think there's a set amount of time you have to wait. There's not a sort of time down to the minute amount of time you have to wait to put the oil emulsifier in. We generally just recommend you weigh out your water phase first and then you put that in there to give your water phase a head start because it's bigger and then you weigh out your oil phase and your emulsifier and once as soon as you've weighed it out you can add it in. You can do it where you add them both in at the same time but sometimes it means that you then have your water phase takes a little bit longer to heat up and you might find that your oil phase reaches 75 degrees faster than your water phase does, so that it, but it doesn't tend to need more than sort of a minute or two as a head start because water is quite um, not as dense as the oil or less dense. No, other way around. Sorry. But yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. Okay. So Alison asks, how do you know how much of each ingredient to use when you are making your emulsion? So Beatrice, I'll go to you for that one. Well, it depends on a lot of factors and it's really hard to explain all of it here. That's why we have uh, our diplomas. So you can learn with us how to create your own emulsions and to design your own, your own formulations. So I think we can't cover everything here. So I'm sorry, I can't help with a more complex answer here today. That's okay, sometimes the simple answers are the best. Um, okay, so Maggie says, if you can't access the cucumber glycerate, what ingredient would you add in, I suppose, to make up for it? Brooke, what would we suggest? So if you can't find cucumber glycerate in particular, you could look for a different glycerate. You could try maybe a berry-based glycerate or a witch hazel glycerate or any other sort of glycerin-based extract. Or if you find that difficult as well, you can just use glycerin by itself. So glycerin on its own is a great humectant and can be very beneficial in your products by itself as well. So that's worth adding in. And glycerin, luckily, is really easy to find, especially it's been a really trendy ingredient lately, so it's very easy to find glycerin on its own. If you don't want to buy any more other ingredients, you could increase the water phase in order to um, account for the missing glycerate, but we would recommend adding in some sort of humectant because they are really good for especially hydrating around the eye area. Great, amazing. And we actually have a blog post, I think, on glycerites as well. So if that's new to you, please do find, um, just type in the internet, for me to have Botanica blog section or go to our website and if you go to our blog section it'll be on there or people in the comments can share it in there as well but then we have loads of good information on that if you want to take that extra step and make your own okay question from Lynn Lynn's looking to go that extra step so I have an anhydrous caffeine powder I've never used before and would like to add it into the eye cream when I make it after I watch all the episodes. Would this be a good choice as an additive? Uh, Brooke, what do we think? So I'm not 100% sure what you mean by anhydrous caffeine powder because caffeine by nature in itself is a, um, a hydrophilic ingredient, which means it's soluble in water. So you wouldn't necessarily have, I don't think, a anhydrous caffeine powder but Beatrice can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, no that's right uh, because the caffeine powder uh, comes as a dry powder so it doesn't have any water added to it that's why we call it anhydrous in this situation. Okay there we go so but in that case you can um, of course add in some caffeine powder you could add it into your 
just right you could add it into your um anywhere into the formula really it would mix well with the glycerite i believe but yes you can have a look at your supplier and see what percentage they recommend and adjust the formula accordingly okay yeah just a little tip because mm -hmm. caffeine is a little bit tricky to work with sometimes it tends to crystallize after some time because it's more soluble in water when heated so if you're adding caffeine add it to your heated water phase instead of adding it before uh forming your emotion it might help you great thank you okay next question okay so Susanna says I was hoping to learn hopping I think but I was hoping to learn how you decide on the proportions of each chosen ingredient if one is trying to formulate their own ingredient will that be explained either in this masterclass or the VIP how do we combine ingredients just to pop in here quickly so we have the masterclass that we're working on and that is the 10 episodes the 10 free episodes that we have offered people and there's a VIP option to upgrade where you get a formulation booklet and we also have a exclusive VIP uh, live that we did and um, some extra videos. So they are two separate things. But essentially, we do teach you how to be a formulator within our courses. So this is kind of a big question. I'm not sure if Brooke and Beatrice can answer this in its entirety. But we do teach you how to uh, be a formulator. Do you want to just add anything to that, Brooke? No, I think it's a really big question and it's one mm -hmm. of those things where you have to sort of have a look at a lot of different ingredients and do your research make sure you're understanding the ingredients and that's something that we cover in depth in our courses so if it's something that you're really curious about and you want to um start learning then our courses would be a really good option for you exactly okay let's go to kathy so Kathy says, when heating the rose hydrosol and jojoba oil, does the heat destroy any of the compounds? Beatrice, what do we say? Well, these ingredients are quite heat tolerant, so you can heat them, there's no problem. Jojoba oil is uh, an, oil, an oil that can be heated, so you won't lose its properties. Unlike other oils that are more sensitive, like, for example, I don't know, passion fruits, acid oil, or some other unsaturated oils. So for these ingredients, there is no problem. You can hit them uh, without losing their benefits. Great. Um, I just want to say thank you too, because we've got people joining kind of all different times. And I, I can see Balbinda says, I love the classes. Victoria says, hello from U Ukraine. Love the glass classes. Kerry as well. Anna. There's too many names to read out here, but thank you, everybody. Um, we loved hearing your thoughts and oh, someone from Hawaii. Fantastic, very jealous. South Africa, that is amazing. Thank you much everybody for joining. Okay. I can see as well, I should add, there's a few questions here going kind of that extra mile. We are just gonna focus on the masterclass and what we're doing in the masterclass because if we do go any broader, it's gonna go so broad and um, yeah, we won't know where to start. Okay. Okay, so Monica asks, hi, where I live, there isn't any olive in 1000. Can we replace it with Lanet wax? Uh, Beatrice, what would you say? Uh, well, you need to look at the composition of Lanet wax. Um, if I'm not wrong, it is a synthetic emulsifier. So it isn't the same as olive in 100. And as I'm not acquainted with this ingredient, I'm not sure if it can be used at the same amounts. But if that's your only option, try it. You can only know if you experiment with your ingredients. So that's a, also a great way to learn how to formulate. Exactly. I don't know if Brooke has anything else to add. No, I think just have a look at the supplier's recommendations as well and see if it is used in around the same percentages as Olive M1000. But from what I've looked up, it, it does contain synthetic compounds. So it's not going to be sort of the same as using Olive M like for like but have a look into it and if it's what you can get a hold of then have a go and see what happens excellent okay from karen i don't think we've done this one karen says how do i make hydrosols such as rose and glycerin such as cucumber and rose co2 extract i think that's a kind of a mixed question in there um basically how do we make hydrosols if someone wants to make their own and can can anyone do that brooke so you can make hydrosols you can um I've seen you can have these little sort of 
tabletop stills that you can get. They're quite pricey, so if making your own hydrosols is something that you want to invest in, then it's worth it, but off the bat, they are quite expensive. Um, I think there's a way you can do it with saucepan lids, but I've never personally tried it myself, so I couldn't tell you how successful that is. Um, in terms of glycerites, though, we do have an entire blog post, as we've already mentioned, on making your own glycerites. Those are a lot easier to do than hydrosols, so definitely have a go with those. And in terms of rosehip CO2 extract, that's not something you can make yourself at home, unfortunately, because it's made using um, CO2 extraction, which is a more complicated method of extraction that is not really available for us at home. It is something you would need to make in a lab with a lot more expensive big kit. So yeah, we're keeping yeah, it simple so for this keep it with the, Keep it with the glycerites for the masterclass. Yeah. <laughs> so Kath asks, Kath says, will any leftover oil in the beaker not poured affect the final outcome? Uh, Beatrice, what do we say? Well, it depends on how much is left on uh, on the beaker. And you can also try uh, pouring the other way around the water uh, into the oil phase. You can try it and see if it works best for you. But uh, if not, try to scrap it with... Um, I forgot the name of the two, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, with a spatula and see if you can uh, remove these leftovers and use them. It's kind of a uh, practice. You get hold yep. of it in no time if you keep practicing. Exactly. And Kath has another question, so we'll do those together. OK, so I only have one thermometer. When checking each beak attempt, do you wipe in between, let it cool down, anything else? Brooke, how strict are we? So I would wipe them between when you're going between your sort of water and your oil, because otherwise you're going to start to have the product emulsified as you're adding little bits of oil in it's not too big of a deal when you do it once but when you're going backwards and forwards a few times you do start to notice a difference so i would get keep a little bit of kitchen towel or sort of um a small cloth or something and just wipe it off between each one you don't need to let it cool down there you can sort of pull it out of one wipe it off and put it straight into the other one because the probe will adjust to the temperature of what its new environment is so you don't need to let it cool down at all Great, amazing. And I can see some people in the comments have just joined us who have just discovered the masterclass. So wherever you're watching it, you should be able to find a link in the description and it will take you um, to wherever you need to go. Um, and you'll be able to get into your study area, you'll be able to download your supplier guide, your ingredients list and everything, and you would have access up to this point of five lessons because we started on Monday and we release one every day at two o'clock and there's 10 in total. So there's, there's a stuff that's behind you, there's stuff that's in front of you. So if you are joining us now, you're in a good place. Don't worry, you're not behind. Okay. Well, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to answer sharp Natalia's question. Do we need to add salt to stabilize the emulsion? Beatrice? Um, no, not in this case. We usually use salt to stabilize other types of emulsions that um, are different from what we're teaching today. We cover it in our courses, but I'm not going in depth uh, uh, about it because it's really complex. Um, but for this kind of emulsion, you don't need any salt. Right. Don't worry. Okay, I'm going to take this question. Twin Virgo says, what will be the first course I should take? Well, we recommend people start with a diploma in organic skincare formulation. But next week, our entrepreneur program, which is a program with a collection of five courses that we recommend people take if they want to make their step and be a formulator, is going to be available from next week. So stick with us, follow the masterclass materials. We'll be talking more about the entrepreneur program kind of from now in the next couple of days. And you'll hear loads about it next week. And we have a webinar next Wednesday where we're going to be talking all about it. So just stay tuned to your emails because we'll be sending you the information. But I would say Diploma and Organic Skincare Formulation is the first one you should take. And that is the first one we advise people to take in the program. And the program is amazing. Brooke has done all the courses, I think, haven't you, Brooke? So yeah, it is one, it is our most popular flagship course. Absolutely. It is a fantastic course. It's where I started as well. And definitely when if you're new to formulating and you even if you're sort of you might need a refresher or you've done different kinds of formulating, 
the diploma is definitely the best place to start because um, natural formulation as well is a little bit different to other different kinds of chemistry. So absolutely, we'd always re we would always recommend starting with a diploma. Absolutely. Okay, so I've seen a few comments like this, so I'll pick this one. So I ended up with an ice cream that is just a little too thick. How can I make it thinner? Um, Beatrice, what would you say? Oh, in time you get the practice of adjusting your emotions to make them, them thicker or thinner. And in this case, I would say you can reduce a little bit the amount of oil, but you need to substitute it for uh, some water um, group if you have anything else to add but i don't recommend uh, when you're beginning to change too much the formulation this um because this uh formulation doesn't have any sort of thickeners or anything in it the main thing that thickens it is the oils and your um emulsifier itself so for this emul this particular formulation we've got an emulsifier that's in the middle of the range that you could use for all of them. What you could do is you could reduce the emulsifier and reduce the oil phase, as Beatrice said, and then up the water phase. But this is where you start getting into more complicated territory of having to play around with ratios and having to work out your percentage formulas. And it does get more complicated than just sort of reducing it a little bit. So it's something that we cover in a lot more depth in our courses of how to play around with the ratios. But yeah, there is ways of making it thicker. And I would also say that if you add your water into your oil phase, that does tend to make it slightly thinner as well. When I was testing it, oil into water is a little bit thicker. Water into oil tends to be a little bit thinner, just as a rule of thumb. It's not mm -hmm. a perfect way of doing it, and you might get a different result. But in general, try adding it that way and see if that thins it out a little bit for you. Thank you, Brooke. And I'm going to come to you for this one because Valvinda has um, a question on equipment and we know we love your lab in a bag. So, okay. So for the formulation practice, how many pots and spray bottles are required? So in general, I'm going to turn this question into when people are starting out with equipment, do they need lots? Do they need just a little? Like how easy is it to get started? So it's really easy. You don't need many things. In terms of spray bottles, I assume you just mean for your alcohol in order to disinfect things and I've only got one to this day I refill it from my big bottle of isopropanol and just have one spray bottle that I use to spray my beakers um, in terms of beakers it is helpful to have a range of sizes and you can get um, I'm sure we've covered this more in the last live we did which I believe was on equipment so you might be have more interesting information in there but you can get um, packs of beakers from places like Amazon that aren't too expensive that have a wide variety of sizes but in terms of sizes I would recommend starting with maybe sort of a 50 mil and a 100 mil I think when I started I had a 50 mil and a 250 mil and I used that for the entire diploma so you don't need many at all you can get away with only two or three Absolutely. And we have graduates, actually, that are studying the courses that we offer, traveling around the world, working from tiny lab bags, and they're still able to complete the courses. So you definitely only need a little bit to start. I'm just going to take two tech questions. One from Yolanda that says, what should I do? I miss all the lessons, tech issues. It happens, Yolanda, don't worry. The lessons are not live. They are in your study area. So all you need to do is head over to your study area. The link will be in the comments from wherever you're watching it from. Just head over there and you'll be able to find the lessons in there and you can download all the materials that you need. And Sarah Wilson says, is next Wednesday the last webinar? It is our main webinar that we do. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about Formula Britannica and what we do, definitely, definitely join that webinar, which is next Wednesday at six o'clock UK time. Okay. Next question. I'm gonna pick this one here. Okay. Is it possible to use a combination of botanicals? So I suppose this person's thinking about using maybe stuff that we haven't suggested yet, but what would we say, Brooke? Absolutely. You can use different botanicals. You can use a few different glycerides. You could use a different um, CO2 extract. You could use half and half. There's lots and lots of things you can do with formulation. And honestly, the possibilities are endless. So if I told you all of them, we would be here <laughs> forever pretty much because there's so many amazing botanicals out there that you can try we cover a lot of them in is it lesson eight i believe yes yeah. lesson eight that we cover yeah. more botanicals that you can use 
So stay tuned for that one. And that gives you a much more of an in-depth insight into different botanicals that you can swap it for. But yeah, have a play around with the ones that you can come up with and just have fun with it because there are so many. And once you start with them, it's very, very hard to stop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very you have a few suggestions in the workbook too, so take a look. Too. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead and get that workbook. As Beatrice says, there's lots of goodies in there. And once you start looking at them and all the things that you can do, as you know, Brooke said, we can't show you absolutely everything. We have to kind of stick to a masterclass so we get you creating something. Um, so yeah, it's good to, good to think ahead, but stick with the masterclass and then go broader. Okay. So this person says, I made a weight mistake and added more cucumber glycerite than I should. I think that was supposed to be an exclamation mark. Will this affect the life of the product? Um, Brooke? So that depends a little bit on how big of a weight mistake we're talking. Um, if you meant to add, for example, 1.5 grams and you added 1.6, you can probably get away with it because there's not a big degree of separation in that, especially because we're making such small batches. That's a really small difference. If you wanted to put 1.5 grams in and you put 5.5 grams in, that you're going to find that makes a big difference in the formula. It's going to be quite sticky and it's probably going to be a little bit harder to um, preserve long term potentially. So I think it depends on how much. So this is something that you judge with more you do it. So try it as it is now, leave it and see if it makes a big difference. But it depends a little bit on how big of a weight mistake we're talking yeah loads of these answers are going to be you're going to have to just try it and see what you think and then sometimes you have to make two just to kind of figure out if you've done the right thing so yeah but there's there's no wrong answers here there's just a practice error and um, yeah give it a go okay someone asks how can i raise the ph Beatrice. Well, in case you need to raise a pH, you need to use a pH adjuster like um, sodium bicarbonate or arginine. I think these are the easiest options to work with. Mm -hmm. And you can get them as solutions. So you just add a few drops and measure again the pH until you get the pH uh, you want. And that should be a, very easy. We have another question actually, so I'll come back to you Beatrice because it's kind of related. Someone says, should we dilute a sample to test the pH? Well, if you're using pH strips, you don't need to dilute the sample. Just take care not to contaminate your whole batch by um, putting your pH strip inside the, the emulsion. Take a little bit of the emulsion and then out for all of your beaker and then put the pH strip on it. And if you're using a pH meter, it depends on the pH meter you, you have. So check the, um, the technical materials of your equipment to see if it works for emotions or if you need to dilute them. Mm -hmm. It depends a little bit on the tool you're using. Great. Yeah, a lot of these things depend on all these tiny little variables, but don't worry, you'll get there. Um, Kath is back. Kath asks... Simple question, water bath with the saucepan and bowl, the beakers are supposed to sit in the water. Brooke? Yes, they are. So when you're making your formulations and you want to melt things down, you can actually do it directly in the saucepan. You don't need to necessarily have a bowl on top. Depends on the kind of saucepan you have and the kind of hob you have as to how close that is. I've got an induction one, so it does work if I just put the beakers directly in there because you, you're not going to be heating up your... Um, water bath very high so it's going to be quite a low gentle heat that you want to melt things down on but yes you want to have these inside your inside the water because the water helps to disperse the heat and helps to melt everything more evenly but I suppose you could do a saucepan with water and then a family with chocolate with one of the bowl with water but the beaker tends to function more as the bowl in this case so when you have a banmarie you have your saucepan and you put your chocolate for example inside the bowl in this case, we have our beakers, which are the replacement for the glass bowl. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, OK, I don't know if we've done this one. I remember now. Um, any idea what size bottles we should be using? Brooke, I'll come to you again, because I feel like you're always talking about the bottles. So for this masterclass, we're making 50 millilitres of this cream or 50 grams. So um, 
we're making 50 grams of the cream so you're going to want a bottle that is about 50 milliliters big it's not always exactly transferable so sometimes you might find you have a little bit left over depending on the shape of the bottle because they're not exactly sort of um, comparable but you want to be looking for containers that are about 50 grams or 50 mils in size if you want a pump bottle for example which we have designed this formula to be used in it'll come in 50 milliliter sizes which should be fine or if you need to put it in a small screw drop jar or something you're going to want about a 50 gram um, jar or two 25 grams or whatever size you want to use but you're going to be making about 50 grams and you can find so many little things maybe in your house. I know I'm one of those people that keeps like little pots always. So just have a think about what you've got. Um, but you can find loads of stuff on Amazon, places like that. There's loads of places that will have those little beakers in stock. So don't worry. I got into the habit when I was starting of, I don't know if anybody else has seen these, but you get these little jam jars and sort of honey jars in hotels. And I used to collect those little mini jam jars and they were about sort of 25 gram sizes. And I used mm -hmm. to use those for little tests as well. I love they those. Quite I good. They're so tons cute. of those. They're too cute to recycle. They go straight they in the jaw. Um, okay. So Yolanda asks, how do you weigh your ingredients accurately? Beatrice, how do we weigh everything so we know what we're doing? You need to use a scale. You don't need to start with expensive scales. You can start with uh, those very simple jewelry scales. And that's it. Uh, you need preferentially to use scales that have one or two uh, decimal numbers. And it should, it should work this yeah. way. Fabulous. OK, so this mm, might be one we can tackle here. Let's see if we can. Okay, so School Project says, some homemade infused oils have herbs first moistened with alcohol. How would this affect the emulsification process and do certain emulsifiers work better with small amounts of alcohol in them? Brooke, what would we say? So I don't know about sort of having the alcohol in the infused oils. I might, mm -hmm. Beatrice might know that better than me. In terms of um, the emulsifier, some alcohols do mess with your emulsification. So you might find that not all emulsifiers can handle any alcohol being in there. You would have to check the um, specifications of the emulsifier you're using to see whether it can handle it. Some do, some can't. So it's worth looking into. Um, I can't say I've made enough infused oils and I haven't used them with alcohol so i wouldn't know if the actual oil itself would then have an effect when it's used within the emuls emuls emulsification process itself but yes um yeah because surely the the alcohol will still float on top of the oil because they won't blend together but you've piqued my interest a little bit that one but i don't know enough <laughs> to give you more of a detailed answer but i'll have a look into it we'll we'll head scratch that one um so we'll come back to you um, okay, so Beatrice, you were mentioning heat sensitive oils before, so we'll come to you for this one. Can we add heat sensitive oils during the cool down phase? Yes, you can, but not in large amounts. You need to use only small amounts in the cool down phase so you don't disrupt your emotion because you can have then uh, phase separation and your emotion can split. But if you use small amounts, like one and two percent, that should work and you shouldn't have any problem to add them at the cooldown phase. Cool, thank you. I just wanted to say I can see lots of questions asking kind of about coffee beans and all sorts of stuff, but we're going to stick to the masterclass otherwise we'll be here forever. But if you do have any questions to do with our masterclass, which is our 10 part series that we are putting on right now, where we show you how to make your very own eye cream, then please do add the question in the comments. And if you do have a question that's outside of it, head over to our blog section, because there's so many blogs on there that cover so many different topics, and I'm sure you'll be able to find an answer in there. So the answer is out there on the internet in the Formula Botanica blog, so do not worry. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't think we've done this one. So, in the current formulation of the eye cream, could you use Olive M25? Do you have surfactant suggestions and how would this change the formulation? Uh, Brooke? So, I'm afraid I don't know of an emulsifier called Olive M25. Oh, made it up. I don't know of that one. I've never come across an emulsifier called Olive M25 from the same brand as the other Olive M's. So, um, 
it would depend a little bit on the inky name of what that emulsifier is. If you mean a different emulsifier, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but in terms of surfactant suggestions, we wouldn't really include a surfactant in this formulation because it's an eye cream. We're not making a cleansing based product and surfactants are something you include when you want sort of foam and cleansing action in terms of your product. But we don't want that in an eye cream. We would just end up with lots of bubbles and it would be very soapy and sticky. So it's not something we would include in an eye cream. So I wouldn't suggest any surfactants for this particular product. But um, if you want to learn a bit more about surfactants, then head over to our blog and have a look at some of our blog posts that contain surfactants. And speaking of which, because this person mentioned Zella Olivium 25 and we don't know what that is, what would we say about the inky name? What is the inky name? So in ink general, what is it? Exactly. I mean, not what is it for that? <laughs> so in general, your inky name stands for your international nomenclature of cosmetic ingredients. So it essentially means the name an ingredient is given that transcends sort of multiple languages. It's the language of cosmetic ingredients. So any cosmetic ingredients will have its own inky name to define the components that it's made with. I do believe we cover this a little bit in the masterclass, but it's essentially the language of cosmetics and your so something like Olive M25 or Olive M1000 is what's called the um, trade name. So it's the name that a manufacturer gives to a specific blend of components that they've designed to do a specific thing. So Olive M1000 is the trade name. And then your inky name is Sorbotan Olivate and Satiera Olivate. So that's the inky name then for that ingredient. If you look up an ingredient by its inky name, that then gives you a much clearer picture of what it is, what it does. And you might find that there are, in the case of preservatives in particular, there are lots of different preservatives with different trade names, but the same inky name. So they might have different, be sold under different trade names, but they have the same inky name. So it's worth always looking up the inky name in particular to try and find an ingredient. So without knowing the inky name, I couldn't tell you what Olive M25 is because I've had I've had a look at the whole stars website a few times and I've never seen that one, so I couldn't give you any more details. I'm and for everyone watching, we do have the inky name in the ingredients list for all of the ingredients that we do recommend for the masterclass. So don't worry, we, we have just given you the name um, that we all use. We've we've covered the world. Okay, uh, let's go for this one. So someone asked, do we go refined or unrefined when it comes to oils? Beatrice. That's a great question. When you have refined oils, you increase their stability, but you lose some of their benefits. So it depends on what you want and what you're looking for for your formulation. But you can use either version, whatever works for you. But here at Formula Botanica, usually we prefer to use unrefined oils because then we can you, we, we can get the benefits, more benefits from the oils. Because when you refine oils, you remove um, color uh, any colorants, um, natural colorants in case like, for example, carotenoids that are present in rosehip oil. Mm -hmm. You you lose some of um, some of the extra components that uh, are present in the oil and these are beneficial so you get um longer shelf life for the oil but you lose some of the beneficial properties so it's right. up to you to it's, decide like loads of things it's up to you just try it if you use one doesn't work just use the other one give it a go just to say everyone i've got about seven questions left and if you have kind of joined us in the middle we are talking about our master class where we show you how to make an eye cream and i know i keep saying that because because people keep kind of coming in and out but you will be able to find the link in the description and um, head over there plenty of time to watch the lessons and catch up and you can always come back and watch this live from the beginning as well and um, get all the answers that book and beatrice are sharing with us i've got about six questions to go in my list um so we'll probably wrap up after that so if you do have a question add it in the comments and we will try and get to it for you okay Okay, this is kind of a trick question because we can't go too much in depth with this because it involves a lesson coming up in the masterclass. But I'm going to go to Brooke for this one. So, hello, I just want to know what might be the most effective natural preservative for this formulation. Brooke, what would we say? So we have chosen a very good effective natural preservative for this formulation, which we will cover in one of the upcoming lessons. So stay tuned for that. You're going to get your answer very soon. 
there are lots of different preservatives that you could try but the one we've picked we've picked for the reason that it's very easy to find it's very easy to find all over the world not just in one particular country it has a broad spectrum coverage and it has the broad ph um, tolerance which is great and it also means it's really easy to work with so it's a really good natural effective preservative and you're going to learn all about it in one of the upcoming lessons fabulous thank you brooke okay we kind of covered this but i'll throw this one out there just because it's a little bit different so if the temperature increases above 80 degrees by any mistake can it be used should i start again beatrice well it depends on how much above 80 degrees <laughs> usually of course we don't recommend uh to heat your ingredients so uh, too much well it as i said it depends if it goes to 100 degrees and you boil your ingredients that could be a problem but if you go just slightly above this temperature it shouldn't be a big problem so it depends a little bit but i wouldn't throw everything away in case it doesn't work out just mm -hmm. start again and yeah. keep practicing it's always good to have it on the side if you do think you've made a mistake and then when you do make it and it goes right you can see you know in real time kind of the error that you did uh, especially when it comes to consistency yeah so just hold on it put it to the side just learn from it that's what we say okay don't think we've done this one brooke but i'll come to you so if i use my own botanicals how do i know how much to use kind of a big question but what would we advise that is another big one so if you're using botanicals that you have, um, whether you've, they're ones you've made yourself or they're ones that you have that are different to the ones we currently have in the masterclass, if you want to swap the ingredients or either you use the same amounts and same percentages that we use in the masterclass, that's what we've worked out works for this formulation. But in order to do that, you'd have to check that those ingredients can be used at those percentages, which if you have different ingredients that are come from a supplier, your supplier will tell you if what um, ratios and amounts they can be used in. So, for example, some CO2 extracts can only be used up to about 5%, I think, is the general rule of thumb. Some are less, some are more. It depends entirely on the extract and its origin and what components are inside of it. So it's worth looking into if you're going to swap different ingredients making sure that they can be used in the percentages that we've used them for in the masterclass mm -hmm. and then using that within the formula if you're making your own botanicals that's a little bit different because you don't have a supplier to go and talk to and ask for the amounts if you're making things like glycerites it should be easy just to swap and use the exact same percentages that we use in the masterclass as we said earlier you wouldn't really be making your own preservatives or anything like your co2 extracts and stuff so everything you could make yourself you should just be able to swap like for like with Great. the same percentages fantastic thank you brooke i'm gonna take this one this is from maria too says where can i access q a sessions as i have missed them i think they were going to say so when you get access to your study area you should be able to see all the q a's you should be able to see all the lessons and you can download all the materials so all you need to do is follow the link wherever you're watching this live it'll be in the description you'll be able to get access to your study area and they will all be in there so don't worry we're not hiding anything from you everything is in your study area so have no fear you are right on time okay next question so beatrice can i replace the cucumber with aloe vera well if you're meaning um aloe vera glyceride that's no problem we can just swap one for another that should work the same of course they have slightly different properties but as for the formulation it should work fabulous i've got two questions to go so i'm gonna go to Beatrice for you for the next one and then we'll go to Brooke to finish off. Okay, Beatrice, so good day. If I wanted to make bigger batches, can we just double it? Is it as easy as that, Beatrice? As it is, in this <laughs> case it is. If you're scaling up to very large batches, of course, some things can be a little bit different, but if you're just uh, going from a 50 gram batch to a 100 gram batch, just double it and everything should work the same fantastic and i just uh, as we're wrapping up i just want to um look at a few comments at the end because people are asking 
where they can watch this Q&A. So wherever you're watching this Q&A, you can watch it from where you're watching it again. If you're watching it on Facebook, if you're watching it on YouTube, it will be there. You can also watch it in your study area. So do not worry. And you've got plenty of time to watch the masterclass. The lessons are available until October 17th. So do not worry. Okay, last question. Uh, here we go. Oh, here we go. I think I've done this one. I'm not too sure. Memory's not very good today. Let's go for it. So I'm confused about rosehip oil and extract. Are they different, Brooke? Very good question. And yes, they are a little bit different. So rosehip um, oil is the oil pressed from the seeds of the rosehip plant. Rosehip CO2 extract is an extract that's been created using CO2 extraction. So they're a little bit different. They've got slightly different compounds within them, but they are both oil soluble, which is a technical term for meaning it's oily essentially, and it dissolves in oil and it has an affinity to oil. So they are different in as much as they have different properties. They have slightly different characteristics. So the um, extract has a slightly stronger color than the oil in general and you would also use them at different amounts so your rosehip co2 extract you wouldn't be able to use in as high as amounts as the rosehip oil but in terms of for the masterclass, if you have extract or oil you can absolutely use both of them we've made um the actual masterclass cream we've made with rosehip co2 extract and you can swap that to like for like with rosehip oil but you couldn't inc swap rosehip oil for extract because it doesn't necessarily, you can't go to, it to as high of an amount so because it has a much smaller usage limit. So I right. hope that makes sense. It does. And I'm going to sneak one in because I've seen two people ask this. Brooke, I'll come back to you again um, because this is an easy one. Does it matter if the container for the eye cream is glass or plastic? No, nope. you can use whichever one you have on hand, whichever one you would like to use. Great, told you it was easy. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I can see people kind of asking just a little bit about where to find the Q&As, but do not worry. You can find it in your study area. You can find it from wherever you're watching it now. The replay will be on YouTube and Facebook. And we have released five lessons so far. So you have plenty of time to catch up on those five lessons. We've learned, taught you how to create an emulsion. We're now starting to talk about botanicals. And then we'll talk about preservation and then we're going to be talking about a host of other good stuff after that. So you have joined us at the perfect time. So thank you, everyone, for joining this live. Thank you for all of your questions. We will come back to whatever the lives are and we will try and answer extra questions in there. And we will also answer the questions on our masterclass support thread as well. We will try and give you as much support as we can. And um, you've all been so fantastic. Thank you for all of your questions. And we will see you on the next live, which I believe is on Monday for Q&A 3. It's your last opportunity. So if you want to join that one, ask us a question. I would love to see you there. Um, thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Beatrice, for answering all the questions. Your knowledge is appreciated and is fantastic. And to everyone, please enjoy the masterclass. Go into our exclusive Facebook group. Give us a post. Show us uh, if you've made your emulsion. Show us if you've added botanicals. We want to see it. We want to see what you've done well. We want to see your failures. We want to see your successes. We just need to have fun. So join our exclusive Facebook group. You can find a link to that in your study area as well. And um, yeah, let's continue the masterclass. And lesson six lands uh, tomorrow in your study area at two o'clock UK time. So thank you everyone and thank you Brooke and Beatrice. We will see you on the next one. Thank, thank you, you everyone. everyone. Thank you for joining Bye. us.